How's everybody doing? Yesterday was an incredible day. Um, what's amazing is there was about this many people who came uh, yesterday to serve day. And uh, yeah, it was so, it was amazing. I got to travel to a few of the locations uh, with my dad, who, who's our pastor, and, and just to help some of the different locations and to see people. Uh, what's so amazing is you can tell when the church is doing what it was built to do, what Jesus designed it to do, to get outside of the walls, to co-labor together, and to make a difference in our community through uh, selfless, sacrificial love. Um, those of you who are here that know that Mayor Barry was here, and he welcomed everybody and just said thank you for what was going on. He told my dad uh, after the big rally yesterday morning, he said, I've never, in, in my years of being the mayor, I have never seen this before. I've never experienced this before. I've never seen a church this willing and this selfless to love our city this much. And I think that's pretty impressive. And so um, I, I, uh, it, it, was, it was very moving. Everywhere we went yesterday was a very moving, moving day. And if you are not a part of this, we'll be doing more of them. Um, but we definitely don't ever, and I'm going to mention this a little bit in the message today, we don't ever want us to think, though, that serving in the community, that we have to wait on a day where the church says we're going to organize something for you. This is not something that's meant to be compartmentalized. This is something that is meant to be uh, an igniter for all of us to go and on our own uh, free will to get, to get people together, to gather and go make a difference in our community with acts of service like we did yesterday. One more time, let's give God a huge hand clap for what happened yesterday. Um, we, we, there's a lot of exciting things happening at the church right now. And... Um, even more so at the next series that we're starting, uh, Let's Talk Church, next week. Make sure that you're here. Uh, it's just going to be a phenomenal series uh, when we're really just building what the church is supposed to be and how Copper Point fits in the original, destin or ri original definition of what God wanted to do with the church. Uh, right before I go in the, into the message today, we're concluding this series, I Love My City. Um, I have some really good friends that are in Ohio uh, that have been on staff at a church in Canton, Ohio called Faith Family, and it's just an amazing church, and um, our, my friends Noah and Stephanie Nickel are moving to Cleveland, and they're going to be planting a church in the downtown Cleveland area, and they launch the church next week, and um, I was talking with Noah uh, this last week, and, and just um, he and Stephanie are, are battling some serious spiritual warfare right now. Uh, the area that they're going to be in Cleveland is called the Preacher's Graveyard because they've had 100 church plants fail in the area that they're going to plant this church. And he was emotional when I was talking to him saying, I'm planting a church in what Cleveland calls Preacher's Graveyard. And I have a little girl, a wife. We don't know where the finances are going to come from. We don't know where all the provision is going to come from. But God has called us to go, so we're going. And so I just said, Noah, we're going to pray for you. This, I'm preaching this weekend, and our church is going to pray for your family and your church that what was once called a preacher's graveyard will now be considered fertile ground for the church of Jesus Christ. So would you guys agree with that today? Um, I know you just sat down, but I, I, think, I just believe that we need to pray to, to, or stand to pray. So let, let's go ahead and stand up. Um, I don't think I'm going to have you stand again, so we'll be good. But this is what I want. I want us to um, just stretch our hands towards them in a, in a figurative way. And, and we're just going to pray over this family. And, and we're going to pray that God would just produce fruit through them, that he would strengthen their marriage when the enemy wants to attack it, when the enemy is wanting to attack their family, that God would strengthen it. And then also that they would have wisdom, that God would provide finances for them and provision. So let's pray. God, we thank you today for this couple, Noah and Stephanie Nickel. God, they're planting a church called King's Church in downtown Cleveland. And God, where the city looks at this area as completely lost, a hopeless cause, you've sent a couple there to bring hope to where everyone else says it's hopeless. God, I pray for wisdom. I pray for provision for this family. I pray that you would strengthen their marriage. I pray that you would bring people to this church, add people to their team, add people to their number, to where we would see New Testament-type uh, dynamic of the church happen in Cleveland, Ohio. God, this city needs uh, you desperately. This city needs this church desperately. We pray for King's Church. We pray for this family. And God, we pray a hedge of protection and blessing over them. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Let's, yeah, be praying for them. And uh, I, I'll, I'll be coming back with some testimonies about what God is doing. You guys can go ahead and be seated today. 
We, uh, so this is the fifth week of the series, I Love My City, and um, it's, I, I've loved this series. I, I've loved the, uh, the vision coming from our leadership, coming from my dad in this series. I've loved um, the endeavors uh, that we're taking in our community, and uh, this, this is what the church is about. And I just mentioned this, but it's about getting together, rallying, and taking church outside of the walls. This hour and 15-minute experience cannot be our definition of church, our sole definition of church, or we will never make a difference in the world, ever. I think that's one of the enemy's greatest tools that he has accomplished with the American church is convincing people that this is the entire definition of church. No, this is an important, vital piece, but we are the church also Monday through Saturday. So in this uh, message today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a neighbor, uh, what it means to be a neighbor. Um, you've probably heard before that the two greatest commandments are to love God, love people. Well, it's actually to, and it's, that's true, but it's actually to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what in the world does that actually mean? And so uh, we're going to dive right in today. Uh, I've got a lot of, of um, good information. And I, my main objective today is to... Um, not just give you information, not just to kind of hit something on, a, on an intellectual wave. I, I want you to receive this in your heart, and I want you to be changed by this as much as I have been changed by this, even writing this this week, to where we really understand what it means, what it means to be a neighbor um, in our community. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. If not, the, the passage will be on the screen. And this is the famous passage of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to actually read the whole story. So uh, read along, bear with me, and um, just pretend it's like elementary story time. Are you ready? Here we go. Luke 10, starting in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Big mistake, right? Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So what he's saying here is, but Jesus, I want to know exactly who my neighbor is. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, compassion on him when he went uh, he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn to take care of him the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper looked at look after him he said and when i return i will reimburse you for whatever uh, extra expense you may have had which of these and this is jesus back talking to the law the expert in the law again which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Guys, you could do an entire five-week sermon series just on this passage. It is loaded. And uh, what we're going to do today is go through three things that we have to understand uh, in order to really grasp what neighboring is. Everybody say neighboring. Neighboring, in the verb uh, type of word, when we think of neighbor, to neighbor, what does that mean? What does it mean to love someone? Uh, there's a lot of that going around in the world right now. If a Christian criticizes anything, somebody will say, you're supposed to love. And you're like, I don't know what that means. You know, what does it mean to love? What does it mean to be a neighbor? And it's really important that we grasp uh, these three things in, in order to understand what neighboring is. Number one is this, if you're taking notes. Uh, we have to understand its mandate. Everybody say mandate. There is a mandate, an obvious mandate, in this passage and many, many, many more to be a neighbor. This is an interaction, though, specifically between Jesus and this expert in the law. 
So Jesus is talking to a group of Jews, a Jewish people, and this expert in the law walks up, and the Bible tells us exactly that he wasn't asking this question genuinely. He was coming to specifically try to trap Jesus, to test Jesus, to try to prove that he was a false prophet, false Messiah. So this guy, an expert in the law, it's important to know this. It's not talking about civil law. It's talking about religious law. So this guy is a religious scholar, all right? So he's a scholar, and he is coming to Jesus to try to stump Jesus on religious things. That's kind of comedic, right? So Jesus is like, okay, you're trying to trap me. This is going to be fun. So the guy is trying to trap him, but why? Why specifically? Because Jesus was always wel welcoming those people who were consistently breaking the religious law. When you look at the life of Jesus, it's like one person after another. Jesus is frustrating religious people by bringing non-religious people close to him. I mean, he's hanging out with tax collectors. You know, the woman at the well who, I mean, who was uh, an adulterer and, and, I mean, and divorced many, many times. He's hanging out with people who are hated. And, and back then, people who are social outcasts. And he's bringing them close. And his gathering is getting bigger and bigger, even among Jews. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, can't take it. They cannot take that this many people are loving a guy who is bringing people close to him who are breaking the religious law. So this guy's trying to trap Jesus in front of a crowd of people to show that Jesus is a fraud. But then, in verse 25, he asks this kind of sarcastic question. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be right with God? I would say, and you may disagree with me, but I would say that this is probably, e either subconsciously or consciously, probably the most asked question in our mind, the most thought about question in any human being's mind is, is there an eternal life? And if there is, how do I inherit it? Because when we lay down in bed at night, when we, you know, those, those nights where you're starting to think about like the crazy things that we don't have answers to, I might, I might be the only weirdo. But there's some nights I lay down and I'm, I'm just looking up at the ceiling thinking, the universe never ends? Heaven never ends? There was never a beginning to God? I was trying to explain that to my kids the other day and my seven-year-old Asher was like, Dad, no. I, when did God start? I'm like, Asher, he didn't start. He goes, oh. Dad, no, 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 no. When was he born? Who's his mom? Like, he, he was never born. God never started. And he's never going to end. And Asher was in our back seat going, ah, ah, ah. Like hitting himself on the head because he just couldn't, I mean, grasp it. And, and when we do the same thing, but I think that this question is something we all ask. How do I inherit eternal life? And so Jesus takes him down this little trip and, and trying to answer this question for him, but he also knows that it's asked in a sarcastic way. So he was probably expecting Jesus to say something like, oh, it really doesn't matter. You can kind of live however you want. Everyone has their own road to heaven. As long as you're a good person, everyone is already approved of and justified. So, um, I mean, basically everybody's going to heaven. Because the perception was that Jesus was very liberal with his belief system, very liberal with his uh, religious beliefs. But when he asks Jesus, Jesus looks right back at him and says, what is written in the law? And the guy tells him the two commandments, and Jesus just says, then go do that. So the guy's trying to trap him, and then Jesus says right back to him what that guy would have said in the first place. He's like, well, this just didn't work out. And so he says, do that. Jesus is telling him to obey the law. But then the man asks this question, and more specifically, he's asking, but who is my neighbor? So he's taking it a step further, thinking that he can trap him with this one. But exactly who is my neighbor? That's really important because the passage actually tells us that he asked that question because he believed that he could justify himself, okay? So I want you guys to get this real quick before we move on to point number two, but this is what this guy is saying when he's asking, but who is my neighbor? Jesus knows that the guy is essentially asking, I need to know specifics so I can check my to-do list with all of my religious duties so I can earn my way into eternal life. Because that back then, the law, when we hear the term the law or religion, that's exactly what the religious law was. That if you do all these right things, you are in right standing and you are justified before God. 
So that's why he's asking Jesus exactly who's my neighbor. I need to know so I can check that box. So I can check that box. And, and subconsciously, again, many of us do that same thing. Because, again, what he's really asking is, what's the minimum standard, Jesus? I don't need you to say, go save the world. I need you to tell me, what can I get by with and still inherit the kingdom of God? Very few of us would probably word it like that to God in a prayer. But by our actions, we say that to God every day. God, what is the minimum standard of what I can do to be classified as a Christian, to be classified as the church, and what's the minimum standard of what I need to do to get into heaven? And that's just a horrible way to live our Christian life. Where's the fulfillment in that? Of going to a God that's given us everything and saying, God, you've given me everything. How little can I give you to where you still interpret this as me loving you? How little can I give you for how much you've given me? Who's my neighbor? And then Jesus just responds and says, well, let me tell you a story. I love Jesus because I think when I read the Bible, when I read the, through the four Gospels on a yearly basis, I look at this and I think, okay, I really like Jesus because I think he's a little sarcastic too sometimes. I think that Jesus could do a little bit of eye rolling sometimes and sarcasm. And when this guy's trying to trap him and he's trying to be all philosophical and he's trying to be intellectual with Jesus and trying to stump him, Jesus just stops him and goes, hey, sit down. Let me tell you a story. It's almost like a little bit of an insult. Would you agree? Kind of like, I don't want you to tell me a, a kid's story, Jesus. I want you to, to debate me. But Jesus won't debate him. Let me tell you a story. And this is kind of a side note, but I love the intentionality of Jesus. When I first became a pastor um, in, our, in our young adult ministry, Wake, uh, Wake, but way back then, about 10 years ago, I first started preaching. And there were some people, some groups of people that came from different churches um, I don't know why, because the college ministry started growing, but they came from different churches, and their sole purpose in coming was to criticize my sermons and find everything wrong with what I would say. Like, I would seriously walk off the stage in the back, and there would be a couple of people waiting there for me, going, I don't agree with that, and you need to prove to me this and this, and going through all this stuff, and I'm a 22-year-old guy, just graduated from college, and I'm like, I am doing the best I can. Like, I could have gone up there and said, Jesus is the only way, and they would have been like, but you didn't say the word cross. I'm like, ugh, you know, like, I, I mean, it was horrible, but their sole purpose was to come and try to humiliate me. I couldn't even believe people would do that, but when I see the intentionality of Jesus in this story, it has been my dad's philosophy, I mean, pastors around the world, and it is mine, that you don't have to teach the Bible in a certain way. You have to teach the certain Bible in a creative way to whatever audience you are speaking to. And so when, this, when Jesus is speaking to this man, this man wanted a debate. He wanted to intellectually debate Jesus, but Jesus knew that the guy didn't need a debate. He needed a story he needed to touch the guy's heart and not his mind. Because the guy's mind was convinced, but the guy's heart was not with Jesus. And you look at the other, I mean, just a few examples real quick. The wisdom that Jesus uses to op how he operates with people. You look at the woman at the well, there was no theological debate. He just walks up to her and says, may I have a drink of water? To Zacchaeus, the tax collector who was a little man up the tree, he says, come down from there. I want to hang out at your house. To blind Bartimaeus, he gave a word of instruction. To the paralytic who was lowered through the, to, through the roof of the house, he gave a word of command. Take up your mat and walk. And here, to the expert of the law, Jesus tells him a story. Don't ever let someone convince you that there is a cookie-cutter way to reach people. Because Jesus is a, a God who loves the individual, and he is creative in reaching them because they are creatively made. So Jesus, this is what's funny, it's kind of ironic. Jesus is actually neighboring this man while he's answering the question, what does it mean to be a neighbor? He's showing this man love and being so intentional with him, but the guy doesn't get it yet. Here's the definition of neighboring, to finish point number one. To meet the needs of all people in such a radical, sacrificial way that it astonishes the world around you. Are you neighboring people in such a way where people look at you astonished and think, why are you doing that? And that's exactly what happened yesterday, what I just mentioned about the mayor, 
people we came in contact with around the city would see what we were doing, and they would say, why? Well, it's because we just love our city, but why? Why would you sacrifice a Saturday? It was radical, sacrificial neighboring. We have a video we're going to show right now that just has a few people from yesterday talking about um, what they did in this sacrificial type of neighboring with Serve the City. Today we spent a couple hours at a, at a park just down the street um, doing some general cleanup, picking up trash, um, chopping down weeds, breaking some leaves, and just making sure uh, everything looked great for the surrounding community and uh, make it a good place for families to hang out. Today we are here at Las Colinas Senior Center and we have cookies for all of the residents and we are basically just here visiting with them and praying with any needs that they may have. We're cleaning schools, um, Tomasita and Kennedy right now, and we're just picking up some weeds, pulling some weeds, cleaning up the entryways, painting fences, just cleaning up everything to make it uh, kind of just look like it's, it's really nice and kind of a welcoming entrance here around the school. So it's, it's really exciting, actually. So as the wife of a firefighter, I get to see a lot of what happens in the station and know the calls that they respond to. And I think it's really important where media has a lot to say um, and they're not portrayed in a positive way all the time. It's important for us to let them know that we're behind them, not only as a family, but as a church in their community. Um, we want them to know whether it's a handshake or a gift basket, that we care about them and we're interceding for them and we're behind them. The joy behind it is just seeing the look on their face when they saw so many people come to serve them. Yeah. They were just like, they were blown away that just everything was taken care of. But right now we're going, going around cleaning everything up. We didn't just dirty it, but we're here to help clean up the mess as well. So it was just, it just brought joy to my heart to be able to give back what they've given us. Isn't that awesome? So number one is its mandate. Number two, if you're taking notes, is its magnitude. Everybody say magnitude. The magnitude of neighboring is something that is scary because Jesus doesn't hold anything back with this story in the lengths that he wants us to go as believers to love people and take care of people. And immediately when I say that, before I've gone through any specifics, I know, I mean, I have a tendency of doing it, and I know statistics would say Almost everybody in here just went, but does God really understand how busy my life is? <laughs> does God understand that I'm not rich? Does God understand that, I mean, I, I don't know if I can do much more than I'm doing. But the magnitude, the magnitude of neighboring is something we really have to get a hold of and figure out how we can accomplish it because it's a mandate. So what Jesus is showing us in this story is that we need to be living so inexplicably that it leaves people constantly trying to make sense of our lives. We need to, we need to love people, neighbor people, and where it is, is so inexplicable to the world, where people are looking at us going, I don't, that doesn't even make sense. So here's what I want to ask you. With anything, with your time, with your, with your love towards people, with your investment into the people who are hungry and people who need clothes and shelter, with your investment into people, are you doing it in such a way that people are looking at you trying to make sense of how radical your neighboring is. And again, this is not in an accusation type of way because, I mean, I'm preaching to myself today. But when we start thinking about that, we quickly start realizing why the church doesn't have as much power, doesn't have as much power as we once thought it did. When we look at the city and what we're trying to accomplish with neighboring, and loving people. Um, today, my dad's not here, and he's not preaching here today, but he's actually in Albuquerque. And he's actually preaching at another church across town on the west side, a church that we love and a church that we have committed to helping. And he's preaching there as a means of completely helping and pouring life and vision into that church. And we're committing to helping them relationally and in every way we possibly can. As a church, that's a great way of neighboring in our community. As individuals, we have to work on neighboring in our community. Isn't that awesome? That's what's happening in our city. There's not too many cities where pastors can go preach at different churches in the same city and be welcomed. And when it's, but it's happening here, and it's happening through our church. That's something to be excited about. So, if your life 
makes sense to the world, you're not making a difference in the world. If your life makes sense to the world, you're not making a difference in the world. What the Samaritan did for the wounded man was very inexplicable. People couldn't explain that if it was a true story. This was a parable. This was just a made-up story that Jesus used as a tool. But if this really happened, there could be nobody who could explain what was happening. The Samaritan was helping a Jewish man who was wounded, and the Jews and the Samaritans were complete enemies. They were convinced, the two people groups were convinced that the other people group was suppressing the other one. And so they were stuck at this stalemate because each of them despised the other one. And when Jesus is telling this story to a Jewish expert in the religious law, a Jewish man, he's telling this story, telling him that his enemy, the Samaritan, is the one who stopped and gave mercy to the wounded man. It's completely inexplicable, but Jesus did it on purpose. So the things Jesus has the Samaritan doing in the story, a few of them are this. He has him feeding the man. He has him sheltering the man. He has him protecting the man. He has him bandaging the man. He has him liberating the man. And when you look at everything the Samaritan is doing, Jesus says every word in this story intentionally, and this is what he's actually saying. At the core of what it means to be my disciple, there's social work. Social work is at the core of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Sheltering people, taking care of people, feeding people. That's at the core of what it means to be a disciple. Now, when we do this, that when Jesus when this guy asks Jesus, "What must I do to inherit eternal life?" and Jesus says, "Do these things." Jesus is not saying, "If you are a neighbor to people, that will save you." He's not saying that. But what Jesus is saying is, when you are saved and when you are my disciple, that should be the automatic fruit of your salvation. When you think about a tree, when you, if you looked at a tree in June and there was no fruit on this tree at all, and it was an apple tree, you would look at the tree and if somebody was standing next to you, you would say, that tree is dead. Why? Because there is a tree that is not producing fruit. But then if you next to it, you saw an apple tree that was producing fruit, you would see the fruit as proof that the tree is alive. And it's the same exact thing with us when we think about our walk with Christ. What Jesus is saying is this story is the fruit that will tell you whether or not you are rooted in me. Do we display this fruit in our everyday life? Do we have deep compassion towards people that are hurting? When you're driving around and you see people that are hurting and homeless and hungry, is your first reaction that they did something wrong, and how dare they, and I mean, they're just a con artist. Even if they were, did Jesus put any stipulations on it? Jesus isn't saying just give away all of your money all the time, but what he is saying is we need to have deep compassion for people that we see as even frustrating to us. When you look at Matthew 25, there's another story that Jesus was, Jesus was telling that is, um, kind of scary actually and I uh reading this the other day when I was writing this message it, it, it's it's scary but Jesus is telling this story where he says in the end God is going to judge people and he's going to separate people into two groups and he uses the image of sheep and goats and he says to the right God will separate the sheep to the right and they will inherit the kingdom of God because when I was hungry they gave me something to eat when I was thirsty they gave me something to drink when I needed shelter, I mean, he goes down this whole list. They did that for me. Because Jesus is saying, when you do it for the least of these, you're doing it for me. And then he says, but on the left, I will separate the goats to the left. And when I was hungry, they didn't give me something to eat. When I was thirsty, they did not give me something to drink. When I needed clothes, they did not clothe me. When I needed something, they drove right past by me. And Jesus is being so pointed in this story and in Matthew 25 with the, with the other story of the sheep and the goats to show us and tell us the fruit, the fruit of compassion is of the utmost importance to tell us whether or not we're on track in our relationship with Jesus. It's extremely important. Here's something interesting too. We're constantly, all of us, me included, we're constantly all trying to limit 
the magnitude, the second point, the magnitude. We're always trying to limit the magnitude of neighboring in our lives. And, and we can kind of laugh about it, but we really do. And there's three primary ways we do this, okay? And I'm going to go through these quickly. The first way we try to limit the magnitude is with the who. Everybody say the who. Not the band, but the Bible, the who, okay? We have a tendency to say this. We have a tendency to want to help people who are like us, who we like, and those who like us. These are the people we have a tendency, the who, these are the people we have a tendency to want to help. And you're like, oh, no, not me. I'm selfless. Well, think about this. I'm just saying tendency. Think about if you're a single mom, and you were a single mom for years, and you were really struggling. And it was, I mean, it's just, it's been a fight to make things happen, to make ends meet, to take care of your kids. And then, you know, one day, um, whether you do end up getting married or not, you come upon money, and things are really going well for you, and you're established and grounded. If somebody were to have a conversation with you about giving back, the bullseye of your heart will be to want to give back to single moms who are still in the process of pulling it all together, okay? We see all the time with professional athletes that once they make it big into sports, when they start giving back, they give back to the community they came from. They give back to the urban communities. They give back to, uh, I mean, teachers that help them, a certain school, because they give to people who like them, who they like, or who are like them. We have a natural tendency to want to do that, but in this story, Jesus blows up the idea that we can choose the who. Because the Samaritan, he chose a Samaritan and a Jew. There were two Jewish guys that already walked by the wounded Jew. And then a Samaritan's the one who stopped. And the Samaritan would have believed that the Jew hated him. If anybody deserved to not be helped, the Samaritan would have thought it was the Jew that deserved to not be helped. But Jesus chose that scenario, and that annihilates the idea that we can choose who. Neighboring is so much bigger than our definition of who. Jesus is saying it's whoever you come across as you live your life, those are the who. The people that you come across at work and at school, the people you walk by, you can't pick and choose who we love and who we're wanting to sacrificially help. We can't limit the who. Number two, the when. Everybody say the when. It's very typical as well to want to help people when it's not their fault. When we feel like they deserve it. Well, I'm only going to help people if I feel like it's a good investment. I mean, I mean if, if I feel like they're irresponsible, <laughs> my money's staying in my pocket. Well, thank God he didn't view us like that on our day of salvation. Because we're all irresponsible and none of us are deserving. And again, Jesus chose the Samaritan to look at the wounded Jew and say, that guy does not deserve my help, but I'm going to help him anyways. And he chose him. We cannot limit the win. Number three, the how much. Everybody say how much. This is the idea that when we say this, and I've said it, I can't afford to help right now. I, I cannot financially afford to help right now. And this is the one that kind of is going to step on toes, including mine, all right? Jesus put these guys on a particular road in the story between Jerusalem and Jericho. This road in the story was called the Pass, the pass of Blood because it was notorious because of its mountain. Um, the, the walkway was in the mountains, and it was all these places to hide. And so it was notorious for robbers to hide and to mug people, to beat them up, kill them, and to steal their stuff. And it was notorious for that, but people had to walk the road. And Jesus specifically tells us this is the road in the story. So everybody he's talking to would have known that. The Samaritan, when he stopped, I want you to think about this. When he stopped, the man was half dead, right? The Bible says half dead. If the man was half dead, could the robbers have been very far? No. And if he was half dead, also, one of the theologians I read said that many of the robbers back then left people half dead in case someone was to stop and help, they would have two times the amount of things to steal instead of the one person who was wounded. This Samaritan and everybody listening to the story when Jesus was telling it would have known that the Samaritan was risking everything financially to stop, get down off of his donkey, and to walk over to the man to help him. Jesus, when it comes to us and what he's showing us in this story, is after radical, radical costliness. 
To be a neighbor is going to cost us. And our first reaction is, can it just cost me my time? Can it just cost me some effort? Well, it's going to cost us those, and it's also going to cost us money. When we truly want to help people, because the Samaritan left the two denarii with the innkeeper, but before he left says, whatever it costs, let me know when I come back, and I will cover whatever. There wasn't a certain amount. Jesus is so intentional in this story. He has the Samaritan leaving saying, whatever the cost. When was the last time we sat down thinking about people in our community being a good Samaritan, and we actually had the mentality, whatever the cost? I'll be honest, my first thought is, I've got four kids. Is it, like, responsible for me to say whatever the cost? I walk up to Mandy, like, our whole paycheck, Mandy, we're going to give it to this guy over here. She'd be like, what guy? You know, like, I, don't, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, and I'm not saying that's what we need to do at all. But God will lead us wherever we go, and whoever we come in contact with, whatever doors we need to walk through, whatever actions we need to take, God will guide us, and through our generosity, will never allow us to be destroyed because of it. He will not allow us to be destroyed. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, in the 1700s, was a very famous preacher, revivalist in, in the Northeast. He led the Great Awakening. And um, in response to someone in his congregation one time that used the phrase, I can't afford to help someone, he says, if we say we can't afford to help, how do we justify Galatians 6.2? Well, Galatians 6.2 says this, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. By definition, this is what's crazy. By definition, we cannot bear one another's burdens without burdening ourselves. By definition, we love this passage. Bear one another's burdens. But every time we read this, our first thought is, can someone bear mine? That's our first thought. I've got some big burdens right now. I'm waiting for a rich person to walk up to me and say, hey, buddy, I'm going to take care of you. And you're like, finally, someone's going to lift my burden. You know, that, that's what we do. But Galatians 6.2 says, by definition, if we are going to neighbor someone and carry one another's burdens, if I take someone else's burden and place the burden on me, I am, by definition, burdening myself. So when we are generous when we give, when we are helping, and it doesn't bring a burden, can we classify that as help? It's good. It's good to give. It's good to be generous always. But what Galatians 6.2 is saying, it's not, it's not Dustin's idea. That, again, just as convicting to me. But it's the truth. Can we truly help someone without it costing us something? Neighboring is a huge assignment. It's vast. That's why I worded the second point, the magnitude of it. It's huge. And we, we, I mean, I, my wife and I were talking about this a couple days ago when I was writing the message. We're sitting there thinking, how can this ever come to pass? Like, how can someone ever read the Good Samaritan and go, I've got it. I am changing my life to be centered around being a Good Samaritan, about, around seeing people who are in need, and I'm going to live my life for people in need. What, I mean, I, I'm, we're sitting there thinking, what does it take for us to fully make that switch? What does it take for Christians to fully make that switch in America in the 21st century? What does it take? Which leads me to the third point, and I'll be quick on it. The third point is it's motivation. What's our motivation in being a good Samaritan? There's only one way to get people to live like this, and it's very simple. And this, this is what it is. We have to stop viewing the needy like the expert in the law did. And we have to start seeing them like the Samaritan did. The, the, uh, the expert in the law saw a needy person as a duty to check a box and say, I help them, but it's to justify myself. It's a rule and it's a duty from God. God said, I have to do it, so I'm going to do it. But the Samaritan viewed it in a completely different way and was overcome with compassion and did it from the heart when the expert in the law did it from the mind. You guys following me with that? So when you look at this story, in closing, this is what it's saying. How do we get this motivation? If we are driven to give to the poor out of duty, it can't take us very far. Because guilt will come upon us the moment we don't do what we think we're supposed to do or we have to do from God. 
giving out of guilt will not take you ever to where Jesus wants you to go with this subject of neighboring. The key to the whole story is to notice this one thing, where Jesus places the religious expert in the story. At the very end of the passage, I'm not going to read it, but Jesus looks at the religious leader, and what he's doing is he's placing the religious expert now in the place of the wounded Jew. And he places him in that place. And of all the people in this story, the expert in the law is placed in in the mind of this wounded man. And now in his mind, the Samaritan is now approaching him and showing him undeserved, unmerited mercy and grace. Jesus is so masterful that in this story, he is forcing this man who only knows things about God with his mind to feel the things of God with his heart, to, go, to feel someone coming to him with unmerited mercy and grace and bestowing it upon him. And this is why Jesus did that. And this is why. Because we cannot be a radical neighbor until we have been radically neighbored. Jesus is telling this story, but it's so obvious that the Good Samaritan is an image of Christ. Jesus is the true Good Samaritan. Because the one who shouldn't have stopped because of his perfection did, and he stopped to help people who did not deserve it, who were wounded on the side of the road, spiritually speaking. And Jesus, the true good Samaritan, stops and comes and says, whatever the cost, even if it's my life, knowing it would be, says, I will take care of you, I will feed you, I will give you spiritual fulfillment and give you eternal life. And I look at this story and I think this, when I have a problem with being a radical neighbor, it's in a moment or a season where I forget how much I was radically neighbored when Jesus stopped and came to me and said, in a moment that you don't deserve it, I'm going to stop and bring you salvation, grace, and unmerited mercy. It's only when we grasp that, it's only when we understand that and keep it at the forefront of our minds that we are driven by a dynamic rather than being driven by a duty. When we are driven by a duty to fulfill all of these religious things, we are literally justifying ourselves. Whether we're realizing it or not, we are trying to earn right standing with God when we view it as a duty. But when our hearts and minds have been changed by the grace of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, when he has been the true good Samaritan in our lives, something shifts. And we think, because of the radical grace I've been given... Now, because of the overflow of that grace, it will overflow into people in the community, at my work, wherever I go, because I physically and spiritually can't keep it in, because it has changed me so much. We have to get there. We have to get there. When you look at the world and how bad everything's getting, when you think about rules, when you look at the Bible, yes, there are rules against racism. There are laws, rules about how we handle our money. There are rules and laws about how we need to help people who don't have money and how we need to help people who are homeless. And, you know, the list goes on with all the things I just mentioned. Yes, the Bible talks about all of those things, and these things are all the biggest problems in our society right now. But if Christians look at these as individual duties that we have to check off to make sure I'm in right standing with God, our hearts have not changed. And we are looking at these things as something to do to justify ourselves. But when we remember what Jesus did for me, and when that settles in our hearts, and we think about how much we did not deserve what he did on the cross for me, it begins to change our hearts, it begins to shift our hearts, and then we begin to look now at these things in our society, and when Christians start really having shifts of the heart, when we truly start allowing the roots to grow deep in our relationship with Christ and the fruit begins to come forth, we don't view racism as something that we need to try not to do. It's impossible to even think a racist thought because you are a brand new person in Christ and what Jesus did on the cross annihilated all of the evil things in our society. But the problem is, the problem is, we're trying to wrap our minds around something that Jesus is saying, wrap your life around it. <clears throat> and if we don't, church is going to be something we check off. Helping someone is going to be something we check. 
being a good husband, being a good wife. I'm going to give a little bit every once in a while. That pastor talks about money because I ha- he said I have to. I have to give time. I have to give money. No. But you're miserable because you view it as a duty. But when your heart is changed, when someone talks about generosity, you begin to leap. Because whatever the cost, my God is faithful. My God is faithful. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm going to end. I'm just like going off now. I, I'm, it's unbelievable how powerful the church could be if hearts just shifted. If hearts just shifted. I mentioned this at the beginning. We cannot compartmentalize what happened yesterday, and we cannot compartmentalize the things of God in the sense of outreach is something we did on Saturday. Church is something I do on Sunday. Um, I'm going to go to my small group on Tuesday night, and my kids are going to go to youth group on Tuesday night, and I'm going to do this on Thursday night, and we start compartmentalizing our walk with God, and then all of a sudden, even if we don't want it to happen, check the box, check the box, check the box, all the duties, and then it turns into I have to, and then when you miss, you feel guilty, and that's not the life we were supposed to live. Charles Spurgeon said this, Jesus demands a love that cannot be demanded, and he requires a love that cannot be required. The love he demands from us can only come forth when we grasp the love he gives to us. Have you grasped the love that he's given to you? Have you truly grasped that? As we end this series, that's our challenge to you. When you look at your city, don't see a list of duties. See opportunity. See a dynamic, not a duty. When you have been dynamically changed by the grace of God, you dynamically give it. We need to live lives that people look at us and they think, and they look at us and say, it's inexplicable. How are they even doing this? The numbers don't add up. How, how do they have that much time to serve at church and do these things and go out and do, I, nothing about that makes sense. When society starts saying that about us, we become more and more like the church of the first century and the possibilities of explosive kingdom growth will come to pass. I'm gonna pray and in this final prayer and I'm gonna end with this. I'm gonna give people an opportunity um, to receive Jesus as your savior and have, to have that heart shift. Is your Christianity something that's only in your mind where you still feel that feeling of, I have to, I have to, I have to? <clears throat> Has it ever shifted to the I get to? Have you ever been overwhelmed by God's grace to the extent that you couldn't help but just start giving it out? Have you ever committed your life to Jesus? If everybody would bow their heads and close their eyes just for a moment, I'm not gonna drag this out at all, but on the count of three, I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to have people raise their heads or anything. But on the count of three, if you want to be included in this final prayer and committing your life to Jesus, the good Samaritan, the true good Samaritan, came down and met us when we didn't deserve it. Deserve it. The cost was his life, but he did it out of love. When we grasp that, it changes everything. If that's you and you want to be a, per, a recipient of that grace and that mercy and that love, would you raise your hand right now, wherever you're at? Awesome. Awesome. A lot of hands just went up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to include you in this prayer. And this is a day that will change your life forever. God, we thank you for every person in this room, all of us. God, as a church, as we conclude this series, God, I pray that all of us would be challenged. When we read a story like the Good Samaritan where we, we don't immediately start just making excuses or viewing it as a list of things we have to do. But God, that you would remind us of what you did for us. And then the overflow of that would be radical neighboring. God, every person that just raised their hands, you see their hearts, you see their minds. God, I got it, as we pray right now, the people that raise their hands even under their breath, where they would just say, Jesus, I know that you are Lord. I know, I believe that you died on a cross to take my place. You came down just like the Good Samaritan, met me when I didn't deserve it. The Bible tells us we deserve death, but you came to give life to those who would call upon your name. And we're calling upon your name right now, Jesus. Rescue us. And let us just be overwhelmed by the unmerited mercy and grace. Let it change our hearts, our minds, our lives to where we view everything differently. We thank you. 
And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.